Good afternoon, everybody. Here with Paul and Josh, uh, of course, and two other uh, good friends. Uh, the first is Dave Roche, who maybe you know uh, leads the Building Trades, one of the leading unions in the uh, state. The other is Christy Bentima, who leads uh, CBIA, one of the leading business associations in the state. Um, we work together closely. They work together closely, put together um, a compromise on the unemployment uh, trust fund, something that had been festering for a long time, was underwater for most of the last four or five decades. And we're able to announce yesterday that um, we've got it on solid footing uh, for the foreseeable future. I really want to thank their good efforts and others making this happen. Uh, and it, w it just passed unanimously in the Finance Committee, uh, uh, so that makes a, a really good start. Um, the tax bill is, uh, hasn't passed unanimously. That's still some work to do there. I will say uh, more broadly, um, as we get into the COVID daily summary, um, this is Earth Day. And uh, let's not forget that these 100-year um, storms, these 100-year pandemics, uh, may be impacted by uh, what's going on with our climate. And uh, so I thank all the people who take that climate initiative uh, so seriously as we do here in Connecticut. Uh, that said, where are we compared to uh, yesterday? I think you see that we did a lot of testing, and I think you see that the positivity rate is low, uh, low in the sense that it's at least below 2%. Low in the sense that our seven-day moving average is 2.5%. That's probably the lowest it's been in a month and a half. So we feel like uh, still we're on very stable footing there, and uh, that gives us uh, the confidence as we go forward. Um, eight more hospitalizations. Um, 515 currently COVID-related hospitalizations. Uh, you know, Josh reminds me that exactly one year ago, was the day here in Connecticut we had our peak in terms of hospitalizations. That was a 1,972, 1,972. Today we're at 515. Uh, I think that gives you an idea. We were losing in many days over 100 people a day. So I still continue to be confident that the vaccinations are making a difference, which takes us to vaccinations. and. Um, what you see here is um, a couple of things. 60% of our adults 16 and above have received their first dose. 51% uh, have uh, received um, their first and second dose, 51%. That's a big deal. Um, you compare that to Georgia and Alabama and those states where it's 30% uh, of the people have received, um, have, been vac have been fully vaccinated. Um, Georgia. Georgia, which is the home of the Center for Disease Control, CDC, is about 33 percent. So uh, thank, thank you. We're, we're making good progress, and you see it's making it a difference on the infection rate and hospitalizations, fatalities. This is sort of interesting. Uh, the first dose rates by age, you can see um, 65 and above. We added 2 percent. We're at 89 percent of the people 65 and above. Jump on just a few more of you, and we'll get to 90 percent, which is absolute herd immunity. Um, 55 to 64, um, they're up at about 76 percent, so really good progress there. And in the younger uh, age groups, at least you can see that we're making um, a big increase over the last week. You know, 16 to 24, we're added 8 percent, um, 25 to 34, 7 percent. So we got to keep it going. We got to keep it going. And I say this in the context that um, Supply is now uh, more than demand in many places. You can often uh, go right online and get an appointment. We're finding that uh, many of our mobile vaccination uh, vans that are uh, out there, um, they, maybe they can do 140 doses in a day. Maybe they're doing 15 doses in a day. So um, we're going to talk a little bit out loud, and uh, Chris and Dave are going to help me in terms of ways we can continue to incent people to get vaccinated. One thing is a reminder that it works. And I think you know that I often like to look abroad to get some indication of what the future may bring. And Israel is a good example, I think, uh, where they are probably, uh, you know, a month, month and a half of head of, ahead of Connecticut um, and way ahead of Europe in terms of getting people vaccinated. Uh, these two lines here are sort of interesting. The blue line, which is going up, is the vaccination rate. And the yellow line is the cases, COVID-related infections per million. 
And I think you can see that as the COVID infections per million goes down, the vaccinations were going up. I should put that in the inverse. The more people vaccinated, the lower it's been. That purple line um, is uh, when they got to 50 percent of the people vaccinated. And you can see at that point, the yellow cases per million line went way down. Uh, Hopefully, we're going to see something similar here in the state of Connecticut. We just passed 51 percent fully vaccinated. I was just looking at that blue line and, you know, I spent eight months saying it's really important we flatten the curve. Remember that phrase when it came to hospitalizations and infections? When it comes to vaccinations, um, you don't want to flatten that curve. And you can see that a place like uh, Israel, which took the vaccination so seriously, once they got to 50 percent vaccinated, it got a lot tougher to get the next group vaccinated, and you see that it took a month to get up to 60 percent. So keep that in mind as we try and give people all the reasons they need to get vaccinated. One thing we're doing with our volunteers, this is Volunteer Appreciation Week. Um, special thanks to the people of Connecticut. 6,000 of you have stepped up, uh, you know, over the last uh, many months. You helped us with testings. You helped us with vaccinations. Um, Helping us now with food distribution, still re real need there, the food distribution sites. Um, contact tracing, some of those contract tracers are now um, knocking on doors and reminding people how important it is that they get vaccinated. Support in schools, you heard with Charlene the other day, um, we're getting our summer camps going, our summer learning camps, and we're gonna need volunteers there. We're gonna have a youth corps that we're paying as well to act as mentors for young people going forward. So appreciate your efforts there. The employer supports for vaccination. Um, you maybe heard of President Biden um, yesterday, I think it was, knowing that we got to work more with business and labor to give people the incentives said to business. Um, we're going to give you a, a, a tax credit. Any company with 500 employees or less, if they get vaccinated, give them the rest of the day off uh, and uh, we'll give you a tax credit to pay for that. Those are some of the different types of incentives uh, uh, you're going to hear about here. Um, On-site clinics. Um, Chris will tell you about this. I can tell you that we're going at the Electric Boat, one of our largest employers, um, next week, and making sure that they have all the vaccines they need to get vaccinated on-site. Uh, free lunch, time off, um, gift cards, raffles. I was just told that Sacred Heart is doing a raffle, and you go in, if you get vaccinated, you're eligible for the raffle, you win the raffle, you get an iPad. Um, these are the type of interesting things that um, are going to make a difference. And uh, Dave can give you some of the ideas he's got to get some of our work sites um, of people vaccinated as well. So with that, let me just... Um, let me hand it over to Chris, first of all. Tell us a little bit what you see in terms of the businesses and uh, what type of ideas uh, we can help you with and what they need to get all their employees vaccinated, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Governor. Great to be with you and, and Dave again, just two days after uh, that historic uh, press conference around the unemployment trust fund reform. Um, you know, Governor, you've been saying from the beginning and we've been saying probably back all the way last summer, getting people vaccinated is critical to both the health crisis and the economic crisis that COVID has, has rained down on the state and, and the country. Uh, you know, at CBIA, we have uh, about 5,000 members with close to 400,000 employees across our great state. And so we've been really trying to get the word out to get, you know, all of those 400,000 employees vaccinated. And, and I can tell you, Governor, the response to the May 19th full reopening that you announced on Monday, people are very, very excited about that and are, I think, charged up and incentivized uh, to get vaccinated. And so um, we want to see as many people vaccinated as possible to fully enjoy the, the May 19th full reopening. Uh, and I'm proud to report that certainly our businesses, our members are stepping up and will continue to step up by doing two things, Governor. They're educating and incentivizing their employees. On the education front, CBI has been working closely with Commissioner Gifford and the Department of Public Health on all the great materials we have out there so employers can educate their employees and the residents of Connecticut about the vaccination um, and, and what it means to them and their families and loved ones uh, to get vaccinated and stay healthy. And as you mentioned, Governor, on the uh, other side, the incentivizing, there's been some great creative ideas out there that we're hearing from the Connecticut business community. Um, there's been that kind of the normal gift cards and bonuses for employees as they get vaccinated. 
uh, paid time off for when you do get the shot and or maybe the day after uh, in case you have any lasting effects, um, which seem to be you know, few and far between. Um, uh, one company we talked to has a, has a paid company lunch when they get to 80 percent. So when all across, across the company, they're 80 percent vaccinated, they're going to have a, a company lunch, kind of a celebrate that that milestone. And then after that milestone, once the company gets to 100 percent vaccination, they're going to they're going to shut down for the day. Everyone's going to get a day off, um, which we we really applaud uh, the companies for doing. And as you had on your slide, a real fun and creative one has been the raffle idea that that companies have started to kick around in the month of May and June, having a weekly raffle, whether it's the TV, yard goat tickets, something fun. And um, if you've been vaccinated and got both shots, you take a picture of your card uh, and send it to HR. They put it in the in a, in a box and pull it out and the vaccinated employees are eligible for the raffle. So lots of fun incentivizing creative ideas going on, uh, Governor. We have one member I want to just kind of shout out, all next in Wallingford, who's really been coordinating closely with the town of Wallingford and uh, just recently surpassed the 80% vaccination milestone. And uh, not a huge company, a small company, but doing a lot of great work uh, and working closely with the town and the Department of Public Health. So there's, there's things that can be done, whether you're a big company, a little company, a medium-sized company, to get your employees vaccinated and CBI is here to help. I know Governor, you're here to help, and uh, and labor is really pushing hard as well. So, great things to come. Yeah, no, thank you, Chris. Um, we're thinking here in state government what we could do. Somebody said, hey, if you get vaccinated, um, you get to have uh, lunch with the governor. Then somebody else said, if you don't get vaccinated, you got to have three uh, lunches with the governor. So, we'll do whatever it takes. <laughs> hey, Dave, um, how do we get guys at the work site vaccinated? Oh, I got a lot of ideas for you, Governor. It's nice to be with you and Chris again. So, you know, as president of the Connecticut State Building Trades, my first priority is keeping our construction workers safe. Um, a construction site is already a dangerous place to be, and we rely on everyone, everybody to do their best to stay safe. If you get the shot, you can get back to your normal life. And most importantly, it keeps everyone around you safe. You might be worried about side effects. But don't forget how scary it's to actually get COVID. Business and labor from time to time tend to butt heads. Not always, but it happens. But we also know how to come together when we know what's best for the state and everyone who lives here. We did it a couple days ago talking about lifting up our unemployment insurance program. And today we're talking about a vaccine. Working together leads to results, and that's especially true when it comes to the vaccine. Governor Lamont, you've been talking about these workplace-based clinics and possibly promoting to get people paid time off to get vaccinated. With that, case, with that being the case, I'll work with my union building trades affiliates to offer vaccine clinics at our union meetings, union halls, training centers, and job sites. I'll sweeten it up for you a little bit too, Governor, because I happen to be known for my my uh, my swing of hamburgers and hot dogs. You get me a vaccination site on a job site, and I'll supply the hot dogs and hamburgers and feed the guys. So let's go, Connecticut. Let's get vaccinated. <laughs> All right. I'll be there, Dave, as long as I don't have to have one of your hot dogs. <laughs> hey, thank you, guys. I really appreciate the work you do together and what you're doing on behalf of the state. Um, with that, Josh and Paul, myself, here to take your questions. See you, guys. Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Yes, Governor, just wanted to see if people are keeping up with their second appointments. Are there stats available on that? Josh, you have those numbers? Yeah, there are. We were actually just looking at this earlier today. We, we've uh, got 96% uh, success rate on people getting their second dose, um, which uh, for a two-dose vaccine regimen, uh, I'm told, is exceptionally high. Um, I haven't seen a federal benchmark on that, um, but you know our providers have been doing a really great job following up with everybody who may be uh, late on their first dose to make sure they get in for their second dose. So we're doing very well there. Perfect. So what is the um, expectation for the percentage of fully vaccinated people in Connecticut? Uh, well, I'll start. Um, uh, six months ago, we saw 50 percent of the people had vaccine hesitancy, not me. I'm going to wait. I don't want to do it. Uh, and I think you see that we're very close to 90 percent of the folks uh, over the age of 75. We're not going to get there for the general population, I don't think, but I'd like to think that uh, Connecticut will take the lead and we continue to encourage our friends who maybe are hesitant to do it and uh, we make it easier for you to get vaccinated. I like to think we're going to get over 70 percent. You saw Israel began stalling out at about 60 percent fully vaccinated. Let's beat that.
Okay, so 70% is kind of the target for the state. And I know that you mentioned that on by May 19th, 70% will get the, the first dose. Is there a date attached to the 70% for fully vaccinated? No, I just sort of came up with that number. I li- I'd like to see 100%. I, I, I see it, it, it works, it's safe, it's effective, it keeps uh, your family safe, it keeps your work site safe, your fellow workers safe. Um, I just made up a number of 70% as a place I thought we could get in the near term. Thank you. News 8. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Governor, you you touched on this. You know, around the country, and you mentioned Georgia. Georgia, and and just one of of several states around the country where they're shutting down max vaccination sites. And I know that has to be surprising to you based on what we've done here. But this this, the thinking outside the box and, and all the incentives and stuff. Can you just talk a little bit more about that, maybe you know, how that came about into this thinking uh, to get creative and find more ways when maybe demand is down and supply is up. For, you wouldn't go to the closing any of the sites, would you? I sure hope not. Um, look, I mean, Josh and Deirdre, we've been predicting sometime in the latter part of April, supply and demand or um, Supply is outstripping demand. Uh, we've seen that in the, some of those southern states uh, a couple of weeks earlier. Uh, we know that, um, you know, maybe younger people, the so-called um, invincibles, maybe don't feel quite the same urgency. And uh, look, we're not in the mandates, uh, but we are into doing everything we can to encourage you and incent you to do the right thing. So we started to have a little fun around the office and talking to business and labor, coming up with some incentives that work. And um Let's give it a try. Any businesses out there, we're all ears. We'll publicize what you don't want to do. Is it a, a free meal, a free baseball ticket? So let's go. Let's get people vaccinated. Dr. Fauci um, predicted that uh, maybe in the first quarter of 2022, by that point, kids of any age should be able to get vaccinated for the virus. As you look forward now, and obviously there's vaccinations that are required for many other things, have you already begun talks about next year? Should that come to fruition? And do you have something in your mind? You mentioned you haven't mandated a lot. Is that something you would consider mandating or is it way too early to talk about that? Well, it's a little early because they don't even have the vaccines um you know, maybe they're in some early tests. I haven't heard that. 16 and above, we're hoping that 12 to 16 will be okay to, at some point in the um, in the near future. We're thinking a lot about universities because universities are congregate settings, residence halls. We've seen flare-ups at universities uh, around the country, a lot less in Connecticut. And um, let's give a little time. If we can do this on a voluntary basis and the overwhelming majority of those folks get vaccinated on their own, that's the best solution. NBC Connecticut. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, The Washington Post had an article today saying that the U.S. is seeing an unprecedented drop in vaccinations over the past week, declining 11 percent. I know you would said that we're seeing about 10% um, every week. And it seems like so far, based off of that graph, they're going well. But are you noticing any kind of trend in line with that? And then I know we talked about this a little bit Monday, but wanted to also know if you'd seen any clarity on the possible reason why. Well, I'll start and then pass it over to Josh, which is my norm. Um, I think we're doing a lot better than um, a, a lot of these other states. We are more likely to wear the mask. We're more likely to get vaccinated. Uh, there is a little more slack in the system, no question about it, this week compared to last week. Um, but I'd like to think we still have pretty good momentum and uh, thousands of people are getting vaccinated every day. Josh, anything to add there? No, that's exactly right. And um, as you mentioned earlier, Governor, you know, this is the, the point at which we forecasted, you know, a couple months ago that we start or a month ago that we start we start to see uh, supply outstrip demand. And, and uh, here we are. Uh, that said, we still have great momentum in our vaccine program. We vaccinated uh, over 40,000 people yesterday, over uh, about 20,000 first doses, about 20,000 second doses. 
you know, we're still getting uh, about a thousand people 65 and above coming in every day to be vaccinated. So, you know, there's still um, very good momentum, but, you know, there's no question that we now are at the phase of this program where, um, you know, the, the uh, demand is starting to ease a little bit. Um, we are seeing that. We're seeing appointments readily available across the state. Um, and, you know, our focus going forward has to be uh, more outbound, right? The mobile units, the door-to-door -door campaigns, the bringing the vaccine directly to people, breaking down any remaining barriers, questions, concerns they have to get those uh, vaccination rates up as high as possible in the coming weeks. If the vaccination rates did dramatically trend downward, would that cause you any pause in the current reopening timeline? I don't think so. I mean, we're uh, over 50 percent now. I think I showed you uh, where Israel is and what the effects were there. But um, it's certainly in terms of continuing reopening, uh, let more people vaccinated, just the easier these decisions are, Jamie. And then lastly, uh, with the opening May 19th, have you heard businesses are having any issues in terms of hiring? Like since many are trying to increase staffing in preparation for that date and going forward, are they kind of scrambling to find people? Uh, we should have asked Chris that while he was still here. Um, look, there's no question that some of the restaurants are, are having a tougher time uh, recruiting people and getting them um, on board right now. But we've given them plenty of notice, uh, you know, bars in the same situation. But I, I think people are getting there. Thank you. Fox 61. Hi, Governor. Now that it's been a few weeks that those 16 and older can get vaccinated, are the vaccine numbers for that younger population that the state was a little worried about regarding vaccine hesitancy or just not wanting to get vaccinated at all? Are they trending in a positive direction? They're trending in a positive direction. I think you saw that chart. You know, they're up seven or eight um, percent in each of those two younger age categories. And um, we're gonna make it easier and easier for them to get vaccinated. I think, um, look, they were, a lot of these guys were high school kids were at home. Uh, a lot of their um, lacrosse teams had to shut down due to a um, infection or a scare or a quarantine. And uh, so I think um, Connecticut was hit relatively hard. And I like to think young people uh, know how to do the right thing. And I, I, just to build on that, I think specifically focused on those 16 and 17 year olds, um, you know, they, when we opened up to them uh, three weeks ago, you know, they started from zero, right? They didn't have any head start from people who work in the healthcare sector, et cetera. Um, you know, just in the last week, we've gone from 20% to 30% of the, those teenagers uh, vaccinated. So in three weeks to get 30% of that group vaccinated is great. It is a little more complicated for them too, right? You need to bring a parent or guardian, someone who can send for you. So we've got clinics going uh, with all of the high schools around the state who are interested. Um, you know, there's a lot more Pfizer vaccine appointments readily available across the state. So we, we are optimistic those numbers will continue to go up as well. And Josh, really quick, that 30 percent, that means that they're fully vaccinated or is that like they've received their first no, dose? No, first, first dose. Okay, just making sure. And then, uh, Governor, quick question on the budget. Were you surprised to see bipartisan opposition to the truck mileage tax that was seen uh, in earlier earlier's, uh, finance committee meeting? Uh, I didn't focus on that. I saw um, bipartisan opposition to a lot of the biggest uh, tax increases out there. I think the, um, uh, the big user fee or the big tractor trailer trucks coming through um you know most of them coming in from out of state is something i think people understand they know we got to be able to pay to keep up our roads and bridges they know that we have this revenue source um mayor pete and transportation down in washington as part of the infrastructure bill will be able to leverage that seven to one and uh if they want to vote no we're um they've got to come up with an alternative they just can't vote no News 12, Connecticut. WTIC 1080 News. Uh, what's the latest on the mask mandate and its future after May 19th? Uh, outside, it won't be required. Inside, I think it'll be required a little bit longer. Uh, Dave, we've been talking to a lot of, uh, you know, restaurants, stores and the such. Um, you know, we have a choice. You can say, let's make it guidance or let's make it, uh, um, let's require it a little bit longer. And so far, what I've heard is uh, let's 
not have any ambiguity. While you're indoors, until we have real herd immunity, I think it's safer to make sure that everybody's wearing their mask indoors. And does that come by way of executive order again, or is the legislature involved in that, in extending that beyond May 19th? Well, uh, that's sort of up to the legislature. As you know, April 20th is the date, and uh, they may say, uh, Governor, I'd, I'd like you to con continue to make these decisions a little bit longer. Or if they want to, um, you know, say, let's have the mandate for another month, or if they want to say, let it rip, but let's, um, that, that's their choice. But my recommendation is uh, we keep that uh, mandate on indoor masking a little bit longer. Any guess on how long? Uh, we're, we're all trying to guess about the vaccination rate and the infection rate. If, if we're like Israel, if I see that um, rate get as low as it is in Israel and I see the vaccinations um, uh, pop up past 65 percent, I'll feel pretty confident. Thank you. The Associated Press. Thanks, Max. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Governor, uh, today, Charlie Baker up in Massachusetts spoke about the disparity in the demand for vaccines, and he's pressing the federal authorities to reconsider distributing vaccine based on the demand in the states and not purely based on population. I wondered what you thought about that, seeing as how we're starting to see a little drop off yeah. in demand. Yes, yeah, so um, I've talked to Governor Baker quite a bit about that, but we have some states where we have a uh, tens of millions of vaccines that have gone unordered, but it's still allocated to those states, um, many of them uh, in the South. Um, we have some states like Michigan that are um, very highly infected, but uh, also they're not all using their vaccines. So um, I would think at some point um, uh, the CDC and the COVID task force may want to allocate vaccines where they know they're being used and those are shots in the arm. Could we use those um, vaccines if we could get them? Uh, right now, we're at, a, we're at a pretty good equilibrium. I think you heard Josh say that. Um, if we got more vaccines, I would make an extra special effort to get some of those who are on the edge vaccinated. And I've read that the um, CDC rates like vaccine hesitancy in states and that Massachusetts is the lowest. Do you know what our rate is in Connecticut? I think we're pretty low in terms of hesitancy, but Josh or Paul, do you know? I don't okay. answer. We got to get back to you on that, Sue. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Connecticut Public Media. Following up on a question that was asked earlier, do we see a connection in the Johnson & Johnson news and a drop off in the um, vaccine appointments? Look, I don't, you've heard me. I don't think it helped, but I don't think there's a really a direct correlation either. I think that um, as you got past 50 percent, like we saw in Israel, you're moving into a category of people that are a little, little more hesitant, a little more wait and see, and we have to work a lot harder with incentives. I'd like to think the J&J &J vaccine will be back on the market very soon. And do we have an update on how the outreach to communities that might need it most and people that are hard to reach or living in congregant settings in uh, low-income areas, how the vaccine distribution is going there. Are those vans that are going out, um, all the distribution, like coming home, zero doses left every afternoon? What do you think, Josh? You know, it's, it's uh, as we've ramped this program up, you know, we've seen very uneven results, uh, you know, and we're putting together a playbook uh, for our local partners on a, a formula that you can follow best practices about how to really maximize the benefit of a, of a mobile clinic on, on a given day. It, you know, involves a lot of pre-work, right? Getting the word out, getting phone calls, doing some door-to-door, -door, really building awareness, getting out on social media, uh, working with community influencers. And what we've seen is that, and for clinics where the, the community really rallies and does all those steps and does it well, we get great usage out of those those vans and, and they're cleaned out by the end of the day. In other cases, uh, we've had we've had vaccination clinics, as the governor alluded to earlier, that were very lightly attended. So, um, you know, this is this is uh, the work that's in front of us right now. Um, we're, we're learning every day about what's working, what's not working, and sharing those best practices with all of our community partners around the state. The Day of New London. Hello, Governor. Um, 
I want to follow up on what you mentioned earlier about the uh, making the vaccines available on site at an electric boat. Just want to get tell tell us about how that came about, how many vaccines you'll make available, and uh, just how that's all uh, shaken out. Josh, you have those numbers? Yeah, I'd, I'd refer you to them actually to the degree that they want to get into the specifics there. But they've they've asked for uh, allocation of vaccine uh, for next week. We're going to help uh, ensure that that's fulfilled and that they get as much vaccine as they think they can uh, administer to their employees. And has have other employers uh, made similar requests? And are you doing that elsewhere as well? Well, up until today, we've we've kind of held back on that, right? We've really been trying to focus uh, our vaccines on on the most efficient channels to get them distributed most equitably. Um, you know, now that we're getting to a point where we do have more supply and demand, we're we're welcoming and inviting um, you know large employers or medium sized employers. If you, if you think you can get to critical mass of employees who are unvaccinated right now and having an on-site clinic would be helpful, you know, we'd encourage you to reach out to your local health department, reach out if you have an existing relationship with a provider, or reach out to us at the state, and we'd be happy to broker those relationships. Okay, thank you. The Waterbury Republican America. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, do we have any information on any breakthrough cases that have been reported in Connecticut involving uh, people who have been vaccinated uh, coming down with COVID? So that, that is uh, 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 information that uh, the State Department of Public Health um, has reported to them and it is tracked. Um, uh, you know, what, what I can say is that what we've seen so far is that the rates are far below um, even what was de demonstrated in the clinical trials of the vaccine. So it's extremely rare. And I think we've seen some hospitals and some clinicians uh, give their perspective from the front lines is that when they have seen a, a breakthrough case, um, it's, it's typically been in someone who, who is older, has a higher risk condition, and instead of suffering very severe COVID as they would have in the past, they're now getting a more mild case and going home healthy. Um, so the vaccines work incredibly well, and, and the, rate, the rates of those breakthrough cases we've seen are exceptionally low. Okay, uh, but that's something you don't have those numbers. That's something public health, from, from what I'm hearing you say here. Okay, um, in terms of uh, the, the high school clinics, um, you're going to be we're going to be turning to these these kids. So you know, I know uh, I think I saw something earlier this week about 515,000 uh, students in public schools. Do we have a number on how many students are attending public and private? Uh, high schools in Connecticut, and do you have like a an anticipated uh, number of who will, how many will get vaccinated? Sort of an assumption like that. Uh, we could get you the enrollment details, Paul. I don't have those at hand. Um, you know, the tracking of the school-based clinics is a little tricky because a lot of you know the teenagers have gone out and gotten vaccinated at mass vaccination clinics. You know, they haven't waited for those school-based clinics. Um, but, you know, the most important thing is that we're supporting every, every high school, um, public and private, who wants to have a vaccine clinic. We're helping ensure that that's something that we can help facilitate and making it as easy as possible for those teenagers to, to get vaccinated. Well, what's, um, what's the supply expectation for, for Pfizer the vaccine? I mean, how many we, we get this week and, and how many might be expected next week? Sure. Well, in, into our state allocation, we've been getting uh, about 50,000 first doses per week over the last several weeks, and we've been uh, told that we should expect that to continue. So, uh, you know, as the governor mentioned, we've got, you know, solid supply right now to, to meet the demand we have in Connecticut. Okay. And uh, I was um, also sort of reading through the, uh, the, the weekly no uh, bulletin to providers, and I see that there's some changes being made into how things are ordering in terms of uh, second doses. And I, I think that might be related to, you know, the, the, the vaccination rates. And so um, are, are we are we approaching second doses differently at this point because of how many people have been vaccinated? No, I think it's more just simplifying the process, you know, based on learnings and best practices as we've gotten deep into the vaccination program at this point. All right, and uh, do we have any information on the um, the, the the goals in the uh, you know the the uh, fifty targeted uh, postal codes this week? Or um, sure. So in our high SBI communities, uh, where we've got thirty one percent of our population lives in those communities, that's the the goal is to get thirty one percent of our vaccine doses administered to residents of those zip codes. 
Um, this week, uh, we got to 26%, which is another one point improvement uh, uh, over prior week. So still not quite at the goal, but continuing to chip away at that gap. Okay, thank you very much. Hearst Connecticut Media. Thanks. Um, either for the governor or Josh, um, is the state prepared to request a smaller vaccine supply than usual from the feds due to starting to see this lag in demand? No, I want to pick up demand. Okay. And, and the state has the ability to do that, to say to the federal government, we're not, we don't have enough arms for, um, you know, all the supplies, so we need a lower dose, correct? Yeah, Julia, my understanding is you've got a fair number of states who haven't, you know, ordered all the allocation that's available to them. And are you seeing at all fewer requests or less requests from providers themselves for new um, vaccine supply or shipments? Hmm. Yes, we have. A lot of our providers have uh, have reduced their, their requests. Um, some of them have had slots go unfilled, um, and so they, have to, they don't have as much they need to request. So that, that is a... That is a uh, you know what you what you would expect to see when supply starts to exceed demand as as we would have expected at the end of April here. And so, what's happening with those doses that they previously were getting? And if you could characterize you know some some context of like what percentage less they're requesting um, now compared to maybe a couple weeks ago or so. Um, it's a difficult question to answer. I mean, we have you know five hundred. Um, provider locations so you know it's very mixed right but basically what it what it does is it gives us more flexibility most weeks up until this point were significantly oversubscribed in terms of the requests that come in from providers versus what we're able to fulfill so that's giving us the ability to now fully fulfill every request out there um, which is uh, basically the position we're in at this point and like you said pivoting to helping out big employers like EB you know with this with these extra doses now that are on hand correct Okay. And then lastly, um, is the state at all regularly polling or, or surveying people to see their interest in getting the vaccine? And if so, um, is there any trends there, particularly around people who say they don't want it? We, we have not done polling on that, no. Okay. Thank you. The Hartford Current. Hi, everyone. Um, I actually want to follow up on what Julia was just asking about. I'm wondering about some of the logistics of... Um, you know, fewer people wanting uh, vaccines. And is there a concern, I guess, that you wind up with more doses going to waste? I mean, it, we talked about earlier in the pandemic, if you don't have enough people, you go out on the street and find somebody who wants a vaccine. But if everyone on the street has already been vaccinated, you wind up with more waste, right? Is that fair? Yeah, you've seen that in some other states. You've seen that much, much less in uh, Connecticut, Alex. And as we're finding, um, as you heard Josh say, we're opening up more and more distribution channels. Uh, we, we added on many more uh, mobile vans so we can take vaccines there. You heard about electric boat and work sites. So we're trying to expand our reach. So maybe those same group of um, uh, vaccine sites don't have the same demand they had a few weeks ago. We've added a number of new vaccine sites to keep up the demand. So we what also, is uh, sorry, go ahead. on a related topic, I mean, we're also expanding to other um, uh, channels uh, like primary care, um, other occupational health providers. Um, and to your point, Alex, you know, when you get down to these smaller quantities being administered at, you know, in, in a particular clinic, um, you know, the, you know, with Moderna and a, you know, a larger size vial, you know, we, we will have probably an environment in the coming weeks where we'll be willing to tolerate a little bit more wastage if you have to open a vial to, you know, fulfill a smaller number. Um, you know, we, we as a nation, right, will have the, the, the flexibility to do that if that's what it takes to get that access um, out to, you know, the, all the nooks and crannies of the state. So we will be, I think all, all states are kind of shifting into that mode a little bit more, being a little more tolerant there. But so far we've had very little uh, still because our providers are really good about budgeting their planning so that they're only opening the vial for what they really need. They're keeping the rest in the refrigerator, saving that for another day. Mm -hmm. And Governor, you said earlier you don't have any plans to um, move away from large vaccine clinics, but I mean, at some point we'll get to the point where those clinics are no longer worth the trouble, right? And so what is kind of like the long-term plan there? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Alex. At some point, you know, um, uh, the worried well, that group that was easy to get to the uh, mobile, uh, those uh, bigger vaccination clinics, um, 
we'll, we'll maybe have to segment the market a little more. But thankfully, we're not there yet, and people are still getting vaccinated. And then I also had a couple of quick uh, non-COVID questions. Um, Governor, I was wondering um, if you had any thoughts about the um, tax package that um, Democrats uh, sub uh, passed or submitted today, whether that seems like something you might sign. No, it's not something that I would sign. Um, Alex, um, for the first time in many years, Connecticut's got a really good momentum, and that's in terms of GDP and employment and new businesses and people moving to the state of Connecticut. I think a part of that is uh, people have recognized uh, we're beginning to get our fiscal house in order. And uh, I think um, the bills I saw, A, on the spending side, uh, doing a lot of spending outside of the spending cap, um, are sort of the same games that got us into trouble over the last 30 years. And responding to that by just more taxes, um, it, that's not the way I think we should be going as a state. But look, it's early in the process. I'm, I sat down with um, some of the leaders today. We'll be doing it again next week as we work through this together. Along similar lines, um, what, were, what are your thoughts on the public option bill that was voted out of the Finance Committee? Uh, well, I didn't see that. I got to see what was voted out. But I think people have heard my concerns in the past that, A, I don't want the um, taxpayers of the state of Connecticut underwriting all the risk on this. Um, that, that makes no sense to me. And, B, I think any bill has got to have play by the same rules as, as the other um, health insurance plans out there as regulated by our insurance commission. The Connecticut Mirror. Governor, what are your thoughts on incentivizing vaccine compliance among the incarcerated population? In North Carolina, prisoners are getting a few days off their sentences for those who get vaccinated. And in Pennsylvania, um, they're getting $25 for their commissary. Do you have any uh, interest in doing something similar here in Connecticut? Well, uh, more broadly, as you know, I'm interested in incentivizing everybody to get vaccinated. And that includes uh, people in congregate settings. And that includes a uh, folks in our correctional facilities. So uh, let me let me think about that. If it makes everybody in that facility safer, maybe something we ought to think about. Sounds good. And switching gears, can you tell me about some updates on uh, vaccine clinics on state college campuses? How many have been done and maybe a percentage of students who have gotten first doses? You got that, Josh? Um, we'll, we'll have to get back to you with some specifics on that. I think all of our state college and universities, both public and private, um, uh, absent UConn, which of course has already, um, uh, you know, gone home for the for the year, uh, have a uh, vaccine clinic or several vaccine clinics going on between last week, this week, or next week. So they're all um, making great progress on getting their students vaccinated. But we can get you some specific numbers uh, uh, afterwards. Thank you. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. Uh, Josh, actually, um, something Kellen was just asking about. Is there any update on the percentage of correction officers who have been uh, are chosen to do the uh, vaccine? Um, I don't have a current update on that right now, no. Okay. Uh, Governor, you said you spoke to or you sat down with legislative leaders today. Uh, how would you characterize that meeting? Uh, what would you guys go over? I sat down via Zoom, to be exact. Um, we went over a couple of things. A, uh, we're going to begin rolling out um, our uh, rolling out the um, federal uh, money we have about six billion dollars, with a real emphasis upon um, job creation, equity, justice, getting our kids back into the game. What that means for expanding health care for everybody, expanding uh, daycare, the uh, biggest expansion of daycare we've ever had. Want them to know that um, you have to think about our budget broadly this year in terms of the amount of additional federal resources we have. And then the flip side of that, what do we do in terms of appropriation and taxes that are necessary for us to get a balanced budget that complements what we're doing with the federal? That was that was uh, most of the discussion. Okay. Um, the Finance Committee, <clears throat> excuse me, also passed a bill today that kind of set up a tax structure for the um, legalized cannabis. Did you guys discuss? negotiate or anything like that, that legalization issue today? No, didn't do that no. one today. Uh, there wasn't a meeting of negotiation. It was a meeting of the governor providing his uh, his stance on where he currently stands when it comes to the budget package that was passed by uh, the legislature. 
Yeah, are there any specific, I mean, I know that there was a lot there um, in that tax package, but are there any specific provisions that you definitely oppose, Governor? Yes. Um, playing games with the spending cap, moving things off budget, the same type of games that got us into trouble over the last 30 years, and big spending increases, which I said I don't think we need. I think we've got an honestly balanced budget, and we're able to take care of those most in need and those who have most been impacted by COVID. And I also reminded people that we have a real equity lens in terms of justice, and that's uh, what I think I've got to do a better job of convincing people we're taking care of the needs out there. Okay. Thanks, everyone. All right. I'm getting a signal from Max. I just wanted you to – it's been a heck of a year for a lot of uh, our kids. Um, we've been thinking about the, um, you know, summer learning camps, thinking about how we work with groups like the Boys and Girls Club uh, of Hartford. So uh, Paul Manz and myself uh, stopped by there the other day. I wanted to just talk to the kids, wanted to see what it was like one year in the COVID, what it meant to them. You know, George Floyd, we just had the Officer Chauvin a verdict of guilty coming through. Just wanted to get a better sense of where these kids were and what we could do to make their lives a little bit better. And Paul, you were there with me. What did you see? What did you hear? Well, thanks, Governor. And I'll say first and foremost, uh, I saw a lot of myself in those kids. Um, while I wasn't a Boys and Girls Club kid, I was a Y kid, uh, someone who went to the Y both after school and in the summer. And we were there with um, teenagers uh, from eighth grade to all the way to seniors in high school who really have gone through a lot this year. They've seen a lot, both on uh, TV in terms of what, is, what occurred in Minneapolis, Minnesota with George Floyd at home and in the classroom. Uh, I, there's anything that we saw is that they have perseverance. Uh, they spoke from the heart and they spoke about uh, what they've gone on right now in their lives and what they look forward to. One of the things that they were looking forward to was enjoying their summer, getting back to what they feel was normal. Uh, I, one of the kids there said he, he looked forward to going to a state park. And when the governor said that we're going to have free uh, bus service on the weekends, you could see the smile on his face uh, about the ability to be able to go not only within the city, but outside the city. But I also particularly thought about uh, Jada, who's a senior at Buckley High School. She didn't want to tell us which one of the two colleges she was thinking about going to, but she'll make that decision very soon. But one of the things that she particularly talked about is um, her senior year, the, the difficulties of online learning, happy to be back in school, but her difficulties in doing her college search. But she also spoke very poignantly about the George Floyd situation and what it meant to her in her interactions with law enforcement. And the one thing that the governor left there saying to everyone was that we're not only going to not only hear you, but we're going to put action and not only just be about words. And for this administration, it's going to start to truly, truly tomorrow when we start to unveil our fully pack, our full package of our federal funding. And so I thought I think about all those kids because I used to be one of them, and I thank Sam Gray from the Boys and Girls Club of Hartford, CEO, for inviting the governor and myself uh, uh, there yesterday. And it just was a reminder of why we are in public service is to serve all those children and everyone in the neighborhoods. Thank you, Paul. You said it all. Take care, everybody. Be 